Welcome back to Think Design Work Smart. I'm Alex Bulbaka and I'm coming to you from the Mosaic Work Studios. And today we will talk about a new pattern for writing tests, automated tests. This is an article that was written by James Shore um, and he talks about uh, something he calls, well, it's a pattern language, but it's something he calls nullables testing with nullables and we'll go a little bit through the article this article is quite long so we won't read everything but I believe this is a very interesting method for writing tests and this is why I think it's worth uh, going a bit deeper into the idea and see later on how, how it applies in practice so today we'll just look a bit at the the general idea with the uh, nullables why uh, where does it come from and how uh, can we use it and what are the trade-offs before we go on James Shore has done a lot of interesting things uh, in software development and in agile software development as well so he's worth uh, taking into account when when it comes to these types of um, interesting topics so the article starts by saying automated tests are important uh, without them programmers waste a huge amount of time manually checking and fixing their code i would hope that this is obvious by now although i still know too many teams too many programmers who don't write automated tests we need automated tests um, in order to ensure first of all to ensure that we are not breaking things at least you know there are always ways of breaking things when the tests uh, are in place as well and without knowing but at least reduce the probability for breaking things and introducing bugs in the existing code but the second and the second thing is um, getting this psychological safety that you can always add code on solid ground which means that you move faster and then he goes into saying unfortunately many automated tests also waste a huge amount of time the easy obvious way to write tests is to make pro tests that are automated versions of manual tests but they're flaky and slow and by bro tests what he's talking about is end-to-end -end tests or full stack tests uh, those types of tests that run on the entry of the system go through everything or a lot of stuff and maybe end up in the storage or if you have a very complex system they might go through multiple components and multiple storages and so on trouble with these tests is they have a lot of reasons for failure for possible failure so when an end-to-end -end test fails you never know why they also tend to cluster uh, when one of them fails you tend to have a hundred of them failing they are also very slow because they go through a lot of things now it they used to be slower because databases were even slower um, now with ssds you can probably use a database um, easier uh, here but there's still an issue of what if the network is down what if the database are, uh, is down what if the um, some services are down you'll always get things that make your tests fail and ideally we'd want a test when a test fails we'd like to know precisely why it fails so that we can pinpoint the place where we need to go and fix things Folks in the know use mocks and spies to write isolated interaction based tests. Their tests are reliable and fast, but they tend to lock in implementation, making refactoring difficult and they have to be supplemented with broad tests. 
It's also easy to make poor quality tests that are hard to read or end up only testing themselves. Um, very solid points here. Uh, just before I go into this, um, the language of testing is so confusing nowadays. If I'm talking to seven different companies, seven different organizations, I'll probably get about five, six, seven, if not ten <laughs> different definitions for mocks. Um, what we are talking about here when we talk about mocks is a test double that replaces um, an existing class. So fundamentally you replace a class with a test double and you use the test double to write isolated interaction based test. So basically you test whether something has called something else. This is what mocks are or the traditional definition of mocks is. Um, mocks are necessarily stubs. There's another test double stub uh, that replaces just that returns values. So when I hear about mocks that returns um, hard coded values, that's a stub in fact. So it's a bit confusing. And then there are spies, yes, all kinds of things. So there are actually probably around 10 different test doubles that you could use that have slight differences between them. Most people think they are using mocks, but they are using a variation between mock stubs and spies. But he'll refer to this as mocks. Fine. Um, their tests are reliable and fast, but they tend to lock in implementation. This is one challenge with um, tests. You need to be very careful when you write automated tests that they don't lock in the current implementation. Uh, particularly if you have interaction based tests, what you'll have is class A and class B and you're testing the interaction between them. You will have class A calls first method A from class B, then method B from class B, then method C from class C, and so on. And you encode this and lock in this implementation into your tests. And this is a test that duplicates the behavior of the code and it's, it's actually a form of duplication that you should get rid of. So yeah, indeed, it's very easy to write things like that, tests like that. Bad tests are a sign of bad design, so some people use techniques such as hexagonal architecture and functional core imperative shell to separate logic from infrastructure. It fixes the problem for logic, but infrastructure is often left untested and it requires architectural changes that are out of the ditch for people with existing code. I mean, there are ways of dealing with this. These two patterns are extremely good. Um, hexagonal architecture and functional core imperative shell. They are very, very good. Highly advise you to use them. I haven't seen what he's talking about. I feel that you can test infrastructure in the sense that you test what I call integration tests. Um, integration test is another very overloaded term, but when I'm talking about integration tests, I'm talking about very specific type of test. Uh, when I have a class that talks directly to an external resource, it could be an external service, a network, database, or data store, whatever, an external API, um, uh, up to testing up to this class, I will mock it and so you, I, or stop it. So verify that you can actually, um, if, if this class integrates correctly with the external system, then everything will be fine from, um, from the core to here. And then uh, I add some integration test that check whether this class integrates correctly with the infrastructure. So I'm not so sure what he's talking about when he says that infrastructure is often left untested. I think you have a lot of means to, to test infrastructure. Now, of course, in practice, 
it's hard to say because many different teams uh, do different things and it is as it is uh, we are not by far we are not doing a good job on the average in this industry of actually having good test suites <coughs> this pattern language describes a fourth option it avoids all the above problems, it doesn't use broad tests, doesn't use mocks, doesn't ignore infrastructure, and doesn't require architectural changes. Sounds really good. It has the speed, reliability, and maintainability of unit tests and the power of broad tests, but it's not without trade-offs of its own. The patterns combine sociable, state-based tests with a novel infrastructure techniques called nullables. At first glance, nullables look like test doubles, but they're actually production code with an off switch. And that's the trade-off. Do you want that in your production code? Your answer determines whether the pattern language is for you. So here's the interesting thing. Um, let me see if we can have uh, an example here. Uh, the test of app there, okay, port app. So basically what he's doing, let me just explain it a little bit. Um, imagine you have a class somewhere in the middle of your system, right? And that class implements production code the code that would be used in production. At the same time, based on a switch, you can kind of turn off the production code and instead use a smart logging mechanism. So instead of doing production work, the class, when that flag is turned off, that class will output events depending on what is happening, what is called and stuff like that. All right. And this will allow you in your tests to say, I want to use this class with production turned off and basically tests turned on, get the necessary information and verify that everything is going as you expect. This is fundamentally what the nullable pattern is. Uh, so here you have a nullable command line. It throws away std out and configurable responses to provide pre-configured command line arguments. They also use output tracking to see what would they've be written to std out. And I won't go into the examples. You can take a look, but you can see things like track output, create null, Okay, creating all of a certain args. And so fundamentally, the each class serves both as production code and as its own test double. And this is an extremely interesting technique. So on one hand, I think that it's uh, It's very powerful because you can change your existing code without breaking it while enabling testability. And this, is, this solves a huge problem because typically in order to enable testability, what we have to do is to use one of the um, legacy me code methods, either the Michael Feathers method or I, I am a proposal for, I've been proposing another alternative method, which is refactoring through pure functions. But no matter what you're doing, you need to start from your existing code, write some tests on it, do some refactoring, both of tests and of uh, code in order to enable testability. Now, the good thing with all this, uh, with this pattern is that 
in order to enable testability, all you have to do is implement the nullable pattern for the classes in your production code, which will still be some work, right? You'll still have to write extra code for testing, which I don't think it's avoidable, and I think it's something that we need to do anyway. And uh, this allows you also to test uh, very easily because you basically turn on and off uh, things based on what you want to test. So you can use similar patterns uh, that we used in the past, uh, that we use today for testing various parts of the, your system. So, <clears throat> this is very interesting. Um, it's talking about some, let's see, some of the advantages, so goals of this um, approach. No broad tests required. Every test is focused on specific concept. Easy refactoring, because everything is encapsulated, basically, so you can extract things. Readable tests, because you have a range act assert, so you don't have any more expectations, setting, and things like that. No magic, uh, so you don't need, for example, to do everything with dependency injection and auto-mocking. Now, dependency injection is actually, I believe it's a good pattern. Dependency injection is not a framework. No. Dependency injection is a design pattern, and it's it's a good pattern to use in many situations. But sometimes uh, it might be an overkill. I mean, if you want to do isolated testing, and if you do tests focused on classes instead of behaviors, then what will happen is that you need to turn almost every class um, to turn on dependency injection for every class. And that's an overkill. But one of the reasons for that is because many teams are still testing at the level of a class. Their unit is a class, when it's, in fact the unit should be a behavior. And this solves a lot of problems with this. But yeah, I've seen code where everything was uh, dependency injected, and it's getting a bit confusing. And uh, to add to that, it was dependency injected using frameworks. You know, Spring is uh, an example where you, you see this type of uh, approach, and it's not that great. Also, auto-mocking frameworks, a bit of magic, right? And whenever you have magic, you'll have some things that are not working as expected, and you won't know why. Hopefully, you won't see this very often, but from time to time you get to this issue. Fast and deterministic. Um, the test suite only executes low code when that behavior is explicitly part of the unit under test. Yeah. And apparently, he also seen additional benefits. It's faster than mocking frameworks. That's cool, interesting. I'd be curious to see how, but in a sense, in mine makes sense because mocking frameworks most likely use some kind of reflection, and that tends to be slow. Uh, so maybe that's the reason. Simple test setup, higher usability in memory infrastructure testing, absolutely. Edge case support, it's easy to test complex cases. Legacy code compatibility, this is one of the strongest things, I think. You can incrementally add things, add these types of testing. Now, trade-offs, nothing's perfect, these are the downsides. Changes to production code. Yes, you'll need to add changes to production code. He says particularly for infrastructure classes. I guess that's correct because you could, you can test together multiple classes. As I mentioned, you test behaviors, and those behaviors would combine multiple classes. 
So you don't need to actually make every class nullable. You will need to make nullable the first of all the classes that touch external resources, what he calls infrastructure classes, and then um, maybe classes that are at the edge of modules, um, depending on how your code is organized. Although the modifications are usable in production, I have production use cases, many of the changes will only be used by test. Actually, this is a very interesting point. I think you could also use this pattern for production testing. And what I mean by that, for monitoring, right? You could make things nullable by rotation and run monitoring code on that and check the results. And in that way, so you can actually run your test suites as monitor that is more in depth than just, um, you know, whether you have enough memory or things like that. It will basically tell you everything works up to this and we might have an issue in, in this area. A very, very powerful method, I think. Handwritten stop code, yeah, you'll need to write some handwritten code. Well, he says it can be auto-generated and takes extra time to write, however, the results are highly reusable. I'd be curious to see this in practice. My feeling is that you'll end up having certain patterns that you can reuse and that maybe you could end up with some kind of a generics implementation of a nullable class with different types of uh, implementations. But maybe I'm wrong, or maybe it will be something that's specific to your code base and not something that you can reuse between code bases. Uh, I don't know. I'll have to try this out, play around with it to actually see. Multiple test failures. All the tests are written to focus on specific concepts. The unit under test execute code in their dependencies. This can result in multiple tests failing when a bug is introduced. Yeah, this is, for me, this is one of the bigger things. But this is enabled because you would test multiple I guess the risk increases with the number of units under test. If you are testing a single behavior, it's unlikely that you'll break everything with one change. And if you break everything with one change, it will be easy to find what. So I would not be as worried about this, but who knows? Uh, we'll have to organize the tests in a, in a certain way. Now, the article goes into explaining more about patterns and how you do this and, and so on. Um, and there are examples in JavaScript uh, and so on. I won't go into all these details, I think there's a lot more to study here. I just wanted to give you a, an introduction and the reaction to this article. I've seen it for a few weeks now, and I think it's a very interesting approach, but I didn't have time to talk about it until now. One, I mean, I guess I have a few other observations. The first observation is that I have, uh, I did a talk a few years ago, it was before the pandemic, so pre-2022, at um, in London, at um, the Software Craft Conference there. And one of my points, it was about experimenting, uh, 
fundamentally, but one of my points was that it's just an accident of history that you, we have test code separated from production code. And because we have this separation, programmers are seeing test code as something and psychologically. You look at production code and we have to finish the production code. That's what's valuable. Test code is something that we have to do because, yeah, whatever <laughs> somebody asks us to, and it's not as valuable. And I think we could solve, it's, it's really a historical accident, because if you look at hardware, you have a lot of um, hardware devices that have a button or a way of going to a self-test mode. Um, you could connect to them or you have a specific button that you push and then it basically goes through a number of tests and checks the different components of the piece of hardware and tells you whether it's green or red. So this is not something new in engineering. We had self-test in hardware for a very long time because it makes sense. We do not have self-test for software in production. And we are just now getting around this idea of introducing uh, a kind of self-test for live systems with uh, tests used as monitoring and with um, self-healing systems and so on. And there's a lot of work to be done there because the reliability of our systems is very far from what it should be. I mean, you can still get to a good reliability, but it is a very big effort to go there. It takes money, it takes time, and it takes uh, experienced people to, who can keep the systems working. And I think if we would go into this direction of finally having tests and production code into one unit, and having a way for every application, in my mind this should be a standard for our industry, every application should be delivered with a standard self-test thing, uh, a way in which maybe not every user, maybe it's a hidden option somewhere, but it's somehow enabled. Um, and, and maybe even for users, imagine if every application on your mobile phone or your, on your desktop would have this self-test function. And at some point you, you see something doesn't quite work right, you could uh, run the, you know, click a button, do the self-test thing, see whether it works or not, and uh, send the generated report in case if it's in case it's an error, the generated report you can send it to the developers to debug it. Right? It's it's something that I believe should be standard. It just makes sense from a lot of points of view. But and if we start having tests and production code as a unit. I think that finally we'll get over this psychological hurdle of thinking that tests are something that you have to write and production code is what's valuable. No, what is valuable is production code that actually works and does what it's supposed to do. And if you can prove that it does what it's supposed to do, then you have a very valuable thing there. And you can use it to monitor, you can use it to identify issues. Like, how many times do you have uh, desktop applications or mobile applications that work on almost every system, except on a few systems that are a bit weird? 
Wouldn't it be nice to just click a button, run self-tests and get the, the, the report for those tests and see what's not working and just it will help you figure out much faster um, what the problem is. So I think overall this approach is very promising. It's an approach that gives you incremental testing for existing code, for legacy code. Implement the nullable pattern for some of your classes, start writing tests, it will just work. Uh, it's um, And I think from the psychological uh, point of view, it will finally couple together and maybe we'll finally start seeing tests and code tests and production code as one thing instead of them being different things right so with this being said i think there's a lot more to look at um i i would love to try this out Maybe I will make a stream for the summer, uh, like I did last summer, uh, a number of episodes in which I tried the technology. In this case, maybe I will use nullables to try a technique and see where we are going. And it will be Alex learns nullables. Let me know in the comments if you want me to do that. What do you think about this technique? And um what are the open questions that maybe you you you'd like to answer let me know in the comments we love comments so uh, we encourage you to leave questions ideas you know musings links <laughs> whatever you find interesting related to these topics and in case you are one of the three quarters of people who are watching this video without being subscribed, it helps us if you subscribe, but if not, just leave us a comment so that we know uh, you've been here and you've enjoyed the content. Thank you kindly for a view, and until next time, remember to think, design, and work smart.